Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series where today we're celebrating LGBT History Month. Did you know February is LGBT History Month? Well, now you do and you know I'm going to take any excuse to share with you a little bit of queer history. So what we're going to be talking about today used to be a very little known slither of history, but thanks to the 2014 movie Pride, this incredible story is now a lot more well known. Today we're going to be talking about the minor strikes of 1984-85 to here in Britain and the unlikely alliance that formed between the miners of remote South Wales and London's queer community. It really is a heartwarming story, born out of, let's say, a frustration at the British government at the time. But first, I want to say a huge thank you to Merge Gardens for sponsoring this video. Merge Gardens is a fun, casual mobile game where you can grow your own garden by filling it with nature. Trees, plants, butterflies, birds, ponds and more, whilst you're simultaneously trying to solve the mystery surrounding it. I love how many different aspects of this game there are, there are so many ways to keep this gameplay progressing, like earning nectar to unlock extra garden space, you can play the match 3 game to earn extra items, you can open treasure chests to gain coins which you can then spend in the shop, and all the while you're trying to solve the mystery and save the people who've been trapped in topiaries for decades. I must say that my favourite part of this game is probably the match 3 game, I can get lost in it for hours and I love a game which takes like a small amount of skill but not too much. My job can get a bit heavy sometimes and I really do rely on escapism to help me get through, to help me to switch off at the end of the day and Merge Gardens has been a great way for me to do that. Just switch off from all the life responsibilities whilst also growing a beautiful virtual garden. You can download Merge Gardens via the link in the description box or by scanning the QR code that's on screen right now. And the best part, it's totally free to play. So to give you the full context behind this very heartwarming story, we do need to start with a bit of politics and warning, we are going to be talking about Margaret Thatcher. So let's start with the coal mining half of this story. So for the first half of the 20th century, coal mining was this growing industry in the UK. Obviously a lot of homes relied on coal for heating, but also businesses, industry, and therefore there was just this huge demand for coal, with most mines being found in North England, Scotland and Wales, particularly in South Wales, which is where we're going to be focusing on today, in the valleys. Coal mining was a horrible job. You'd work underground, long hours, in very dangerous conditions. There was risk of rock falls, gas explosions, flooding and injuries from machinery and many men working in the mines would lose their lives to the profession. But because of the aforementioned things, for a long time coal mining was a very well paid job. You can't pay people pittance then expect them to put their lives on the line. And seeing as the mines were generally quite far from the big towns and the big cities, mining communities would be formed. Entire villages whose livelihoods depended solely on the success of the mines. These were single industry villages, the colliery and the villages were united as one. These mines were people's entire lives and as the slogan would later go, when they close a pit, they kill a community. In 1947, the coal industry was nationalised and considerable investment was put into the industry with new equipment and new mining techniques. Over the next couple of decades, coal mining in Britain would become one of the most efficient and safest in the world. However, of course, as we know, the world did start to turn away from coal as an energy source and look to oil instead, and over time, the industry started to struggle. Between 1957 and 1964, 50 collieries were closed, causing widespread unemployment. And this was a huge part of the problem. The government were closing down these big sources of employment where entire communities worked, and they provided nothing in replacement. There were no alternative jobs, just small mining villages cut off from towns and cities and left with no other options. And then in 1979, the Conservative Party were elected to lead and Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in what is probably one of the most controversial leaderships the UK has ever seen. From the very beginning of her leadership, she was uncompromising in her views and goals and she wanted to make industry in the UK more efficient by chipping away at what the Tories regarded as unprofitable industries. Under Thatcher's leadership, many state-run industries were privatised, like gas, water and railways, all of which do still remain privatised today. She also believed that the trade union movement had become too powerful and the mines were clearly the next on her agenda. 
1979, there were 235,000 men working at 223 pits. Just four years later, that fell to 182,000 working at 175 pits. And South Wales was hit hard by this. In fact, South Wales was hit hard by Thatcher's government in general. Unemployment in this area had already fallen to 13%, which was wildly higher than the UK average. When it came to fighting against pit closures, these people were fighting for their lives. The main argument against closing these pits was obviously that it would create massive unemployment in areas with no other industry. And lots of people thought these closures were just revenge from the Tory government. There had been a strike in 1974 in which the government had been defeated and they didn't like that. That strike was actually said to be one of the major downfalls of that conservative government. There was also the argument that coal was the country's most important natural resource. Coal should be protected to ensure the industry's long-term future. What if we can't always rely on oil and natural gas? I suppose maybe a good example was the huge hike in gas and oil prices last year. Some people have been freezing all winter because they simply cannot afford to heat their homes. But what you've got to remember is this. These people were scared for their lives, they were scared for their communities, they were scared their families would starve because there simply wasn't any other work. The president of the National Union of Mine Workers at this time was a man called Arthur Scargill and he maybe put it best. He said, mining communities would not survive. There will be an increase in physical and mental illness, suicide, more domestic violence and the breakup of families. The valleys of South Wales will be nothing more than an ageing, dying community for only for tourists and industrial museums. Arthur Scargill is a British trade unionist who was president of the National Union of Mine Workers from 1982 till 2002, but he had been one of the union's leading activists since the 60s and a member of the Yorkshire mining community. He was very leftist, a socialist, he joined the Young Communist Party for a few years before joining the Labour Party in 1962. Scargill was very much in the camp of fighting for his people, he wanted to fight for the miners, but his leadership was very controversial in itself. Scargill was a very strong personality, for better or for worse, and his use of so-called flying pickets in the 70s, which is basically where they sent striking miners to specific plants to prevent the transportation of coal, was said to be one of the main reasons those strikes succeeded. He opposed the closure of any pits at all, except for those that were considered to be safety risks. As far as Scargill was concerned, there was no such thing as an unprofitable coal mine. In 1983, Thatcher appointed a man called Ian McGregor to head the National Coal Board. McGregor had previously been able to turn the British Steel Corporation from one of the least efficient steelmakers in Europe to one of the most efficient and he nearly bought it into profit. Not quite though. However, he was only able to do this by halving the workforce, leading to widespread unemployment. When he was appointed as head of the National Coal Board, it was very clear that Thatcher did so, intending for him to use the same techniques on the mines. In March 1984, the National Coal Board announced its plan to cut the nation's coal output by 4 million tonnes, which the National Union of Mine Workers estimated would mean the closure of 20 pits and the loss of 20,000 jobs. The very same day this was announced, miners at a colliery in South Yorkshire walked out on the job, and Scargill called for a nationwide strike against the planned pit closures. But he never held a vote to do so. Now, Scargill had his own reasons for deciding not to hold a ballot with the union. He said that holding a ballot would have allowed mine workers whose jobs appeared safe in that moment to vote against a strike that was intended to help everyone. The vote would have been open to miners across the country, but different areas were kind of dealing with different levels of risk. He also said that a national ballot would conflict with the chance for each area to call it individual strikes, and he hoped for a domino effect. He hoped that each area would strike, and so the next one had pressure on them to do so, and so on. But this lack of a ballot would actually turn out to be one of the downfalls of the strike. It was used by the opposition and the government to delegitimise the strike and turn public opinion against them. Scargill was holding a dictatorship, they said. The miners didn't want this, and now they're stuck with it. Chances are that Ballot actually would have voted in favour of a strike though, and then that would have made their fight stronger and the Labour Party could have spoken out in support. Would have, could have, should have, I suppose. But Scargill was right in his determination of what Thatcher intended. She did want to accelerate the end of the coal industry. For months, in anticipation of these strikes being called, the government had been preparing by stockpiling coal, by converting power stations to burn heavy fuel oil instead of coal, and by recruiting drivers to transport coal in case railway staff supported the miners. 
Thatcher was not intending to bend strikes. She was rock solid in all of her convictions, and depending on your own political stance, that was for better or for worse. Thatcherism was said to be a new kind of conservatism. It was much harder politics. So the strikes began in March 1984 and Thatcher responded with a hardline approach, leading to many clashes between the police and striking miners and a prolonged and bitter dispute. Seeing as there was never a ballot held, some miners did still have the chance to turn up to work if they wanted and to be provided with jobs to do if they did so. Whilst in most cases it would be entire communities choosing whether to strike or not, there was the occasional miner who did choose to continue working because they needed the money. So the National Union of Mine Workers would send those aforementioned flying pickets to mines where people were trying to work to try and persuade people not to cross that picket line. So the police would turn up at the mines and that's where things took a turn for the worse and things would often get violent between the police and the picketers. Whilst a lot of the time it was just a bit of like push and shoving between the two sides as strikes and protests always tend to do, sometimes it would be a lot worse. The newspapers played up and exaggerated the violence of the strikers at every chance they got to try and rally the country against the miners, all the time ignoring the violence of the police. And we all know there was violence from the police. In June 1984, miners from across the country turned up at the Orgreave coking plant in Yorkshire to stop supplies of coal from reaching the plant. There were thought to be 6,000 picketers met with a team of 8,000 police officers, including mounted officers and 60 police dogs. It turned incredibly violent very quickly, with mounted police charging pickets with their batons drawn in something that became known as the Battle of Orgreave. Just under 100 strikers were arrested that day, and this is where the gays got involved. Because the queer community at this time knew firsthand the violence of the police, they knew what it was to stand opposite a government that just didn't want you. One of my main sources for this video is the book Pride by Tim Tate, which is actually written after the 2014 movie by the same name was released, and the book features the first-hand accounts of people who lived these strikes. Jonathan Blake, a gay man and actually the second person ever diagnosed with HIV in the UK, says of the police's treatment of the queer community at this time. The attitude of the police was horrible. We were just filth. Outside the Colhern Gay Pub on the night, there always used to be police presence. In the long hot summer of 1976, there were riots in Earl's Court because the police had been harassing gay men so much. There was continual harassment. Martin Goodwill describes raids on clubs by the police because even in gay venues, men weren't allowed to dance together. There was a 19th century bylaw which prohibited licentious dancing, aka two men dancing together. Entrapment was also very common in these clubs, especially in the toilets by so-called pretty police. Gay men were continuously hunted down and arrested by the police for importuning. They were actively seeking people out to arrest. Now this is happening in London in the early 80s, but it might surprise you to learn that homosexuality was actually decriminalised for men in England and Wales in 1967. It wasn't illegal to be gay. However, as you just heard, gay men were still being punished for their sexuality until incredibly recently. According to Peter Tatchell for The Guardian in 2017, over 15,000 gay men were convicted in the decades following the decriminalisation because so many anti-gay laws remained and police focused on them. The age of consent for sex between men was 21 compared to 16 for heterosexual people. Gay men could also only have sex on private property with no one else present in any part of the house. This meant that you had to own your own home, doors had to be locked, there could be no one present in any other room, otherwise you were breaking the law. You were a gay man who shared a home, sorry, no sex life for you. As late as 1998, seven men were convicted of offences under these laws. 1998. Procuring gay sex was also illegal, so the inviting or facilitating of it. So you could sleep together, you just couldn't flirt or initiate sex in any way. Peter Tatchell writes in his article, which is fascinating by the way, I'll leave a link down below, that the year before the partial decriminalisation in 1966, 420 men were convicted of gross indecency. Eight years later, the annual number of convictions had risen by 300% to 1,711 people. Police would stake out parks and toilets, luring gay men in just to arrest them. 
Gay clubs would have disorderly house charges shoved at them. Gay and bisexual men and lesbian women would continue to be arrested for decades for public displays of affection under breach of the peace laws. It was legal to be gay in theory, just not in practice. And I do also want to take a second here to talk to you about lesbianism as well, because you might be noticing I've only been really referring to gay men. Lesbianism is a tricky one throughout history because it's never technically been illegal. In 1921, MPs did actually introduce a bill which would have criminalised gross indecency between women, punishable in the same way that it was for men, but when the bill made it to the House of Lords, it was promptly struck down. But not because these men were surprising allies. The Lords actually believed that if they made lesbianism illegal, it would bring attention to the fact that lesbianism existed and hysterical, feeble-minded, weak women would fall prey to this great sin that never before even crossed their minds. In a true display of lesbianism here, my cat wants to come join me. <laughs> Am I a stereotype? Potentially. Right, please sit nicely. Thank you. The Lords also said that it would increase amounts of blackmail against women who liked to share beds with friends for reasons of fear or nervousness thanks to the war, which maybe is nice, I suppose. But that does not mean that no woman or lesbian has ever been punished under homophobic laws, nor does it mean that lesbians or bisexual women, but mostly using the language of the time here, were immune from the anger of the police. They would be beaten, assaulted and arrested, just like their male counterparts. So yes, it's safe to say that the gays and lesbians of this time knew what it was like to be victims of the police. And around the time of the minor strikes, the queer community started to realise that they were being arrested less. There were less police hanging around waiting for them to step out of line, because the police were now on the picket lines, focusing their energy on the strikers instead. And there's also the media element here as well, as this was the early 80s, news of the HIV AIDS epidemic was starting to spread, leading to further villainization and demonization of the gay community. And all of it just pushed the gay rights movement back by decades. And exactly the same thing was happening to the striking minors, being struck down daily in the press. Is it any surprise that the queer community started to feel sort of an affinity with the minors, whose lives were being destroyed? Brett Harron said to Tim Tate for Pride, I very definitely saw a parallel between the way we, as lesbians and gay men, were portrayed in the newspapers as deviant, a threat to normal society, and what the minors were now experiencing at the hand of the Tory supporting press. They were coming under attack in a way that we'd been used to. In part of her efforts to win the strike, Thatcher's government also sequestered the funds of the National Union of Mine Workers, meaning there was no point in any supporters sending donations directly to the union. It wasn't going to help. Instead, supporters were urged to twin with mining communities, mining villages, and send money directly to them, directly to where the money and help was needed the most. Because of course, with the miners striking, they weren't earning any money, and so communities had to come together to feed the families, to keep homes warm, to keep villages running. Thatcher publicly called the miners, who did this dangerous job for years to keep this country running, the enemy within. Meanwhile, in London, gay men Mike Jackson and Mark Ashton decided to collect for the miners during the 1984 Pride March, and being the activists that they were, decided that more needed to be done to raise awareness of the miners' cause in London's queer community. So they got together a group of friends and formed the LGSM, Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners. When one member, Nicola, was asked by Time Out in 2014 why she joined the LGSM, she said, I saw workers' rights and sexual liberation as parts of the same fight. Thatcher was out to smash the National Union of Mine Workers. She was also exploiting the AIDS pandemic to demonise the increasingly confident gay movement. I wanted to help miners win and to bring down the Thatcher government. One of the group's main meeting points became Gaze the Word, a bookshop on Marchmont Street in central London, and it's truly a wonderful place. If any of you ever find yourselves in London, I urge you to go and make a visit to Gaze the Word and maybe make a purchase. It's the oldest LGBT bookshop in the UK and played a major part in LGSM. There weren't many places at this point that you could be openly gay, and Gays the Word was a vital part of the community. If you were newly gay in London, this is where you'd gravitate to. It's where you could meet others like you, it had a notice board where you could find queer-friendly rooms, events, and you could find out about your own history. There wasn't much queer literature about queer history in the UK at this time, but Gays the Word was the place you'd find it if it did exist. But in order to put the money they were raising to good use, LGSM had to find a mining community to pair with. 
One of the members of LGSM was a member of the Communist Party and through that he knew a man in South Wales called Hewell Francis. Hewell was also part of the South Wales support group in Delice, one of the South Wales valleys suffering thanks to the strikes. Hewell said to Tim Tate that he was in his front room one day when he got a phone call from the secretary of the Communist Party in Wales, who had a message from a group of gays in London. He found out they'd been raising all this money, but they weren't able to make a link with a mining community who was prepared to recognise and respect them. Whilst some communities were willing to take the money, it's very safe to say that the miners, these blue collar workers raised to be manly men, were homophobic. Most people were in these times, people were brought up to think that homosexuality was perverted. Some communities would have taken the money, but they wouldn't have ever been prepared to acknowledge a relationship between them and the LGSM. But Hewell Francis said yes, and he sent another man called Di Donovan to London to pick up the cheque. Dye would say that upon meeting Mark Ashton and Mike Jackson, he was taken with how similar their struggles seemed to be through talking about the strike and their politics. Before this though, Mike Ashton had already sent a letter to Hafina Heedon, who was secretary of the Neath, Delice and Swansea Valley Minor Support Group, asking if they could formally twin. Hewell had planned to bring it up at the next meeting, but the letter got there first. Sean James, one of the group's members, said, When the letter was read out, when the meeting was told it was lesbians and gays support the minors, there was a lot of tittering. It was like a nervous laughter that went around the room. And I remember thinking to myself, why are people laughing? She says there were immediately jokes, macho men at the meeting saying things like, well, boys, we'll all have to stand with our backs up against the wall. That damaging idea that all gay men are perverts and are going to assault any man they come in contact with. Sean said that she didn't care who these people were. They'd gone to the bother of raising money for them so they could jolly well accept it and say thank you very much. Meanwhile, lesbians and gays support the minors were still back in London fundraising, but they did meet a lot of resistance. Many members of the queer community asked if the minors would do the same for them if the tables were turned, or in fact the tables had been turned for many years and the minors never did anything to help them. Surely the money being raised within this community should go back into the community towards AIDS research. That's something that could have been debated for days on end, but this group at the end of the day was the LGSM, they were there to support the minors, that was their goal. So the group would go out in groups doing collections. They couldn't go out on their own because a lone queer person out raising money for the minors would have been a prime target for queer bashing. They said that at locations like Gazer Word, fundraising was quite successful, but at nightclubs like Heaven, they'd face a lot more backlash. The businessmen running the clubs were Tories at the end of the day and they didn't like them being in there. But then they got one of the lesbian door guards at Heaven to join the cause and apparently she wouldn't let anyone into the club without putting some money in the bucket, which I just love. A bit of context, which I suppose is quite important to talk about here, is that in the UK we have a really big issue with classism, something which I really don't think is spoken about enough. The middle classes look down on the lower classes with disdain and the middle class are much more likely to be conservative to support the Tories and that was even the case if you were gay. A lot of the richer gay men behind these queer clubs, queer businesses, who may have had the means to donate more to this cause, were very pro-Thatcher and anti-minors, so the LGSM came into a lot of trouble. Another story from the Pride book that I just absolutely loved and had to share is from an LGSM member saying that he used to collect at a pub called the Union Tavern at the Oval, where Lily Savage would perform twice a week. Now Lily Savage was the drag queen alter ego of Paul O'Grady, and if you live in the UK you definitely know who Paul O'Grady is, he's very famous here for a number of reasons, but he grew to fame through being Lily Savage. Most younger people today will probably know him through his talk show, The Paul O'Grady Show. But anyway, Lily Savage was very vocally supportive of the miners and she had to take the collection bucket on stage and not let anyone leave this pub until they donated. And people did because apparently they were terrified of Lily, which is just iconic. Apparently they'd go from getting four pounds in an evening to 25 pounds, which was a lot of money back in the 80s. Whilst the LGSM were fundraising in any way they could in London, back in Wales, the women of the community had taken the lead in the support group. As Hugh Francis pointed out, women were much more experienced in fighting for their rights than the men. He also says that women were sacrificing a lot in supporting their husbands on the strikes, so they made a conscious effort to empower them, to give them control of what was going on. The men were out on the front line picketing and so the women remained in the villages, collecting and doling out the food, doing what they could for the good of the community. Women took the lead. 
some people were literally starving in these villages because they couldn't afford food, but that's what Thatcher wanted. She wanted them to give in and go back to the mines so then she could dismantle them. That's when food parcels became a necessity with a support group saying that everyone had the right to a food parcel if they were on strike. Every penny they collected was shared fairly between all the striking families. In early September 1984, Di Donovan told the support group that he'd invited the LGSM to come down to the valleys for a weekend. He wanted them to come and see the community that they were helping so much with their money. Apparently the support group was shocked, they didn't really know how to respond to the idea of a group of gays descending down upon the village. There was a lot of discussion as to how they handle something like this. One of the men came out with a comment about how that means they're going to have to watch men dancing together. Sean James said that they've been watching women dancing together for years because that's what happens in Wales. The women will dance together whilst the men just stand at the bar. Sean James is amazing. If you want to hear more of her voice, please read the book. She's fantastic. So the last weekend in October was organised for the LGSM to come down and everyone was very nervous about the whole thing. There was a lot of discussion about where they were going to stay, a bunch of minors not wanting gays in their homes, especially with the rising misinformation about AIDS. A lot of people at this time thought that by simply shaking hands with a gay man you'd contract the disease. The LGSM headed over to Wales from London in two minibuses, one of which was actually pulled over by the police upon entry to Wales, but luckily they were let go without incident. They were headed to the small village of Onwin. I really think I pronou- I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong. My Welsh pronunciation, short horror, is not too great, but I'll put it on screen so you can actually see how it's spelled. And this village was not an easy place to get to, especially in the 80s with no sat-nav or Google Maps. The group got completely lost and spent hours driving around, arriving much later than intended, and they ended up spending the first night on Dai's floor because everyone else was asleep. That's 27 people on his lounge floor in total. The next morning they were split between families across the valley and there's a really funny bit in the book about the lesbians and how they were all vegetarians, which is a stereotype that's still very common today. Christine Powell, one of the support group women who took some of the gays in, is quoted as saying, they told me that they were a vegetarian and I thought, you may be gay and I can handle that, but what the heck do I do with a vegetarian? On the Saturday night, the plan was for LGSM to actually meet the miners and their families at the miners' welfare, which would usually be jam-packed. The LGSM, as you can imagine, were terrified. They were putting themselves in a situation as openly gay people and just hoping they wouldn't become the victims of a hate crime. This village was a very isolated place. Most people there had never met a single gay person, at least as far as they knew. There was a lot of curiosity about these big city gays coming to their tiny villages, who dressed different and acted different. Everyone was very nervous. But then, as the LGSM walked in, somebody applauded, and they said they were met with the warmest of welcomes, and of bingo and dancing. Or at least that was for the most part. There was no denying that the women were much more comfortable about this than the men who were said to be quite standoffish. The men weren't hate criming, but definitely they weren't comfortable. The women and the gays made friends very quickly when it was realized they had the same values. It seems the women saw some sort of freedom in the LGSM. This was a very traditional village where men had a wife and two kids, the nuclear family. The men worked, the women stayed at home, and that was it. For some, I'm sure it was probably very suffocating, but that was just the way it was. And then in breezed these gays with this big city lease of life. There was no societal standards holding them back, no expectations. They just lived life as they wished. There was just a lot of curiosity, the classic questions from straights to gays, who's the husband, who's the wife, who does the housework? But alliances were made, these lifelong friendships. And as the LGSM headed back to London, their dedication for raising money for this community only strengthened, especially as they headed into winter. In November 1984, some of the lesbians broke away and formed their own separate group called Lesbians Against Pit Closures. It was the same idea, just another women's only group who could go into women's only spaces to fundraise there. Also, a lot of the lesbians weren't comfortable with men, even if they were gay. They felt like men were dominating the conversation, just they wanted their own voice. This wasn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it just was a thing. Eventually though, the two groups did find a way of cooperating and working together. After the first visit to the valleys, the women of Onwin made multiple trips up to London to see their new friends. This was a completely new world for them. They did all the gay clubs, they were finding out about the existence of cannabis and casual sex, which just wasn't much of a concept at this time in the valleys in these tiny communities. 
Jane Frances Hedden said to Tim Tate, one night we went off to Heaven Nightclub and of course there were gay men everywhere, but we liked them, they were non-threatening. Some of them were quite feminine and they were just the loveliest men we had ever met. Compared to the village boys, the macho village boys, these were really caring men who wanted to listen to you and they were really friendly. Around this time, LGSM hosted their biggest fundraising event yet, a benefit concert that they called Pits and Perverts. The queer community has a long history of taking words that had been used against them and turning them into positivity, reclaiming the words. So they use pervert here in a very positive light. The benefit was scheduled for the 10th of December and they got a band called Bronsky Beat to perform, which at the time was one of the biggest names in music. They'd had three top 20 singles in 1984 alone. And on top of that, all the band members were openly gay, which was groundbreaking for the time. A lot of people turned up that night to see Bronsky Beat alone. They didn't particularly care about the cause, but still, that's where all the money went. 1,500 people crowded into the electric ballroom, minors and gays alike, and they managed to raise £5,650, more than £20,000 today. That's a lot of money for the cause, and it led to an upsurge in other donations as well. The Neath, Delay and Upper Swansea Valley Support Group realised that this was more money than they needed, so they shared it with other local communities who were also struggling. It made such a difference, but it was still December and people were still struggling. In 1985, the public attack against gay men reached a height, thanks to the increased prevalence of AIDS in the media. I do have a whole other video about AIDS, which I'll leave linked, but the public fear of this so-called gay plague made it pretty hard for men to be openly gay in public, particularly carrying a donation bucket with the words emblazoned across the front. It became more difficult to fundraise, but it was also becoming more difficult for the miners to keep up with the strike. In the early months of 1985, there were rumours that it was going to have to come to an end. People needed money and the government clearly weren't going to cave. They'd fought really hard for a long time and nothing had changed and now people were starving and freezing. People were angry about this. This had been a whole year of their lives, but they had no choice. On the weekend it was decided that the strike was to end, LGSM were in Wales, sat with Sean James in her home, and she said the atmosphere was just dreadful as it was announced on TV. The South Wales Union leadership had voted to go back to work. On March 4th, 1985, led by colliery bands and union banners, the striking miners marched back to the pits to resume their work. It was a really sad time, but something positive had come out of it. As Shan says, she was terrified that life would go back to as it was before, that very traditional housewife life, and she'd lose all the friends that she'd made through the LGSM. It was this new world, people's eyes been opened to the lesbian and gay community and the joint struggles that they shared. Two communities who you'd think have nothing in common had come together and forged lifelong friendships. These isolated valley communities were changed forever. You can make friends in even the most unexpected of places. As expected, soon after this, Thatcher started closing pits across the country. In 1985, nine collieries were closed in the valleys alone. And the battle continued for both the miners and the gays. Now, when you think of the Labour Party here in the UK, you tend to think of them as being the more gay-friendly of the parties, but that hasn't always been the case. At the time of this strike, gay rights just hadn't made their way into any of the big parties. Labour actually tried to distance themselves from gay rights because they thought the Conservative Party would use it against them. So the gays didn't really have anyone on their side and homophobia also ran rampant through the unions as well, or at least it had up until this point. The National Union of Mine Workers had never supported gay rights, but after LGSM, miners started to wear their badge. It was a small show of solidarity. And then when 1985 London Pride rolled around in June, the LGSM asked the miners to march with them. Pride back then was much smaller than it is now. It wasn't a party or a celebration. It was very much still political. And I don't really think anyone expected the miners to turn up. The starting point of the Pride March that year was in Hyde Park, with LGSM deciding they wanted to march in the middle of the parade with their banners, regardless of who turned up. And then the miners did turn up. The miners and their families from Delize arrived in a red minibus that LGSM had donated to them, as well as another large coach full to the brim with people, people they'd never even met before. Just miners turning up, showing their solidarity. And honestly, I've got goosebumps even thinking about it. 
This wasn't just the community they directly had helped. This was people from all around showing up, all across the valleys. So many people turned up that the Pride Committee told the LGSM they were going to have to lead the march, and that's exactly what they did. At the very front, directly behind the Pride 85 banner, was the LGSM banner, and behind that, the miners. Over 1,000 people turned up. Months before, people had asked, would the miners do the same for us? And the answer was yes, they would. This was one of the main turning points in bringing the gay rights movement into the wider public, using the pressure of this to push the Labour Party to finally include gay rights on their agenda for that October's conference. And it was included, a motion committing Labour to backing gay rights was put to a vote. And of course people still tried to get it removed from the agenda, but this is where what the LGSM did changed history forever. The National Union of Mine Workers came on board, and alongside them they brought in the other unions, and through that they got the numbers and votes they needed. The mine workers were very well respected at this time and if they backed something others would quickly fall in line and they ended up winning by 600,000 votes, the first time a gay rights motion ever got through at the Labour Party. This was the first step on a long journey to equal rights, all because a couple of gay activists wanted to do something for a community they saw themselves in. When they started LGSM they didn't envision something like this, they just wanted to help. It just goes to show how the tiniest of actions, how the tiniest bit of goodness out in the universe can go on to change things on a fundamental level to help save the lives of so many people. Of course, there was still a long way to go, but it set the ball rolling. Less than two years later, Mark Ashton, the founding member of LGSM, would be diagnosed with HIV AIDS, and he'd die just 12 days later of pneumonia. His legacy lives on to this day. Jonathan Blake, the second person in the UK to be diagnosed and another LGSM member, somehow defied all the odds and he's still alive today. He threw himself into LGSM thinking that he was going to die soon so he might as well dedicate all his energy to this cause. And then he survived. On the right medication today, HIV can now be undetectable and undetectable means untransmissible. In 2014, the movie Pride was released and I highly recommend you go and watch it. It's a truly beautiful story and for the most part, true to life. In response to the movie, the group reformed in October 2014 and throughout 2015, the members walked in 12 Pride marches across the UK. In London, they led 4,000 people carrying the National Union of Mine Workers banners. That autumn they did decide to wind down the group again just to focus on the task of keeping the legacy of 84 to 85 alive and preserving all of that. And that is the wonderful story of lesbians and gays support the minors, a true story of what solidarity can lead to, what love and acceptance can truly mean. I love queer history, we all know this, but rarely does it make you feel good, rarely is it heartwarming. Through the hurt and upset in this story, there are wonderful rays of sunshine. It demonstrated the importance of solidarity and the power of collective action. And I just love this story. Thank you again to Merge Gardens for sponsoring this video. The details will of course be in the top line of the description down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.